So in this lecture, I'm going to introduce the time propagation algorithm. And um, unlike most books, I will introduce it uh, for logistic regression. Because I made uh, logistic regression a little bit extra complicated by introducing the softmax instead of using the standard logistic function. Um, but that allows me to treat this as a neural network and already allows me to apply the back propagation algorithm. And I will teach it in the context of this very simple example as opposed to try to do it for a very general network. Because for a very general network, I have to introduce abstract indices and I have to go over all, all these computations and it's sort of very hard to explain it in, in that generality. So I will explain it with a simple example. I will, however, introduce a different kind of generality which you will not find, uh, I think, on any book, uh, which is the layer-wise generality, where we're going to think of, um, instead of thinking of backpropagation as taking derivatives through a network, you know, go passing a signal through a network and then backpropagating derivatives, as you'll find in the books, for example, excellent books of uh, Kevin Murphy, of Chris Bishop, um, we're going to instead take the modular approach of trying to figure out what computation does a single layer do? What does a layer need to know? It needs to sort of know how to compute from the input, compute an output, and it needs to have a mechanism of taking an output derivative and then propagating it back. And it also needs to compute the derivative with respect to some parameters. So we've seen three types of layers. Uh, linear layer, which just does uh, uh, linear regression. Softmax layers, which log softmax layers, which just exponentiate the input and divide it by the sum of the um, exponentiated inputs. And we've seen the, um, another kind of layer, which happens to be a loss function, uh, which is the, the, the entropy. Uh, and it's very clear that we could have our layers, for example, for root mean square error, for quadratic error, or you know, the, the exponent of a Gaussian. Uh, we would just have um, um, a layer for that. We could construct a layer for that term. We cons could construct layers not for sigmoid functions, but for any arbitrary function. And then in this layer-wise way of doing things, we will only have to specify um, what is the function that the layer computes, what is the derivative with respect to the input, and what is the derivative with respect to the parameters, if the layer happens to have parameters. So you need to specify three things. And this is how we code neural networks properly. You code each layer independently, and you provide three functions. Forward, backward derivatives, gradients. So provided, um, and I will talk about them as messages. So you have layers, which are objects. They have three messages. And provided you have this, you can construct arbitrary networks. Because if you have software where you have all these layers, and this is, in fact, what you're doing with Torch. You have all these different layers um, in a class called NN for neural network. Um, there's another class, uh, NN graph, that allows you to build all sorts of arbitrary topologies. And that's a very nice uh, extension. Um, and so when you code things, if you, if you have an idea for a different layer, maybe you don't like this sigmoid uh, function, and you want to have something that's and a piecewise, a quantized sigmoid, for example, because you're dealing with you know, some aspect of the signal that requires quantization, um, then you would just write the forward message for it. You might make this piecewise somewhat smooth, so you can actually write the derivative backward. Um, and if it has parameters, you, you write the expression for the derivative. So instead of thinking of taking the derivative of the whole network, provided you know how to take the derivative of very simple functions, that's all you need to know in order to code a method. You code layers, you don't code networks. You don't try to write an algorithm that works for the whole network, you write an algorithm that works for the layer. And then when you opt then the other thing you need now is that when you optimize, basically you just call layer after layer. Provided they send the right messages, building a neural network is just a question, it's like Lego. <laughs> you take a block in the layer, put another piece that's the next layer, and another piece, another piece, and you can make all sorts of shapes, and those are your neural networks. Um, and then, the, the provided we have the right protocol for passing messages forward, uh, passing derivative messages backward, 
we'll always be able to do local computation and get global consistent computation. So we'll get the right derivatives all throughout the network and we'll get the right uh, messages, forward messages right throughout the network. And once we have all the derivatives, then we just call SGD. We put also this derivative vector and we just do the usual thing. Uh, theta is equal to the all theta minus alpha, the gradient <coughs> vector. And you repeat that for a few billion iterations or whatever it is that you have to do, um, and you're done. You have an answer. And then you can use the model to do all sorts of uh, predictions. Um, okay, so th that's sort of the, the idea. Um, we're going to go from local to global consistency, and we're going to do this in Torch. Um, the only reference I found about this is the Lacanol paper by Leon Boteau um, on this, but um, there's a sort of separation between how you will find backpropagation written in books and how it's implemented in Torch and Cafe. And the version I'm going to give you is the version that is used. Um, I've talked to Kevin Murphy um, about this, and he's working in the next, as part of the next edition of his book. Um, he will include this layer-wise uh, formulation of backpropagation. Okay, so logistic regression. We know how to write the cross entropy loss. Um, so we had. Inputs xi, we multiply them times parameters. There were two parameters, uh, two vectors of parameters, theta1 and theta2. Um, and then we do the log softmax function, and we do it twice uh, for one term and the other term. Um, and, it, and then we add them up, weighted by the indicators of the data, and that gives us the cost function. And we can express this as uh, uh, a network, as we saw. Um, so we have an input xi that goes into a linear layer. Um, and the linear layer produces two outputs, xi times theta 1 and xi times theta 2. So when I just write xi, I mean the whole vector. So that's a dot product of the vector xi times the vector uh, theta 1. And then I put those two uh, scale, uh, to those two uh, uh, one-dimensional variables into the softmax layer, which just basically computes LSF1 and LSF2. It takes the log of the softmax function. Um, and then the negative log likelihood is the function that I'm showing you here in purple. It just takes um, the indicator of class 0, multiplies it times LSF1. It adds to it the indicator of class uh, 1 times LSF2, and it does this over all the data set. Um, how, you how you do messages, and you could, uh, how do you do pass messages is sort of very important. Um, so in some of the code that you will find online, some of the demos of logistic regression, um, the points XI are being passed through the network one at a time. Um, that's not necessarily ideal when you try to implement this in GPs and so on because you, you might be calling, you might be passing information, getting something started just for one point. So often you try to pass it in many batches. So, and, and the code that we've given you for your practical is all, it's using many batches. So you actually pass a little batch of data. In this case, the size of the batch is small n. So you, you have i equal 1 to n points in your batch. Um, you pass the whole batch forward. This is a particularly useful thing to keep in mind when working with GPUs. Okay, so that's, um, that's the architecture. And to make this general, I'm going to introduce um, um, some variables. I'm going to call this Z1. And I'll use the index, upper index, um, here, not to indicate the power, but to indicate the layer. So the exponent indicates layer. Um, this is going to be Z1, 2. And this is Z1, Z2, 2. So layer 2, and I have output 1 and output 2. Um, this is going to be Z3, 1. And this will be Z3, 2. And then this guy here is Z4. Okay. And the reason why I'm going to have only Zs is because I want to write an algorithm that only depends on Zs. Um, it'll be easier to do the, deriv the derivatives than 
I mean, you saw in the previous class what happens when you try to carry all these terms. Um, it's very tedious and prone to error. Um, now, once we have, um, once we have, and, and just to make it clear, um, z1, 2 is equal to x i theta 1, um, z2, 2 is equal to x i, there's an i there, times theta 2, um, z1, 3 is equal to um, LSF, which is this function, which is log of e to the z i 2 divided by, sorry, e to the z 1 2 divided by e to the z 1 2 plus e to the z uh, 2 2 and likewise z2 3 is equal to log of e to the e to z2 2, 2 and then it has the same denominator okay and finally we know that um, z4 which is just equal to the cost is the sum over i indicator of class 0 times um, z13 plus the indicator of class 1 times z23. Um, okay. So I can write all this in terms of only sets. Um, and if I do that, um, and and again using the definitions that I have, where this is this whole guy here is z one one. How am I going to parse this? This is very hard to parse. Let's do it with colors. Colors are a good way. Um, so I have one one is um, basically this green guy appears here and here and purple is something that depends on x i which is at 1 and theta 2 so it will be this um, and this guy here And then I have Z2, um, and Z2 is um, uh, the, the product. Um, so I have two of these products. Anyway, so that's Z2, they're just the products between these guys. Actually, Z11 is, sorry, I made a mistake here. Even I got confused with so many. Let me try to write this cleanly in colors one more time. Um, Z12 is the, um, it's hard to tell with that. Z12 is just X1 theta 1. Uh, x i theta 1, so this guy here is z 1 2 and so that's computing this function here I then have this other function which is computing this block and and then the log of softmax is z uh, 3 and then z4 is the cost function. Um, the point that I'm trying to make here, what, uh, what we have with this network is we have compositions. Um, 
um, I'm taking z1, I'm multiplying times theta1, and then I have a function that calls it, which is it takes the dot product of theta1 and z1, and then I have, um, um, and then I evaluate uh, the log softmax twice, and, and that gives you, and then I evaluate this whole expression to give me the cost. <coughs> So, if I want to, um, and I just realized one thing, this theta, I should have it as for consistency before I've had it below. It's layer one, parameters one and parameter two. Now, if I want to compute the derivative with respect to this, I know how to do it. Um, the derivative with respect of T of theta with respect to one particular parameter, um, which one did I pick? Theta one. Um, by using, because I have a function, um, I have a function of uh, two variables, and each of those two variables are functions of two variables, and each of those two variables are functions of two variables. Um, and, and so we, we have this nesting of functions and that's why I need all these brackets. Um, if I want to compute derivatives, and this is still not the efficient way of doing it, this is still a tedious way, but it's faster already than the one I had before, I would have to compute a derivative of z4 with respect to um, the function z13, and then I have to compute the derivative of z13 with respect to um, Z12, respect, and then Z12 with respect to um, theta1. But I also have to compute the derivative of Z4 with respect to Z31. Um, so 3, 1, and then 3, 1 depends on Z2, 2. Okay, and that only dealt with this first term here. And so I also have the derivative of Z4 with respect to Z3, 1, uh, 2. Um, and then with respect to the first input, which is Z12. And then theta1. And then I have yet one more, um, which I will have to need to look at, to look at the cross term. Um, Z13. Oops, uh, that should have been two, three, Z1, three, Z2, Z2 is the one that I need now. <coughs> and that's the expression that I get just by applying the chain rule, and I'm applying it twice, because I have a function of two variables, which is in turn a function of two variables. Um, now, the thing to note, and th th this will give us the intuition for the algorithm, how we're going to design this algorithm, is that the, um, if I were to compute the derivatives this way, uh, this will be somewhat inefficient, because I'm computing the same things um, a bunch of times. Like, for example, this term I computed here, and I computed here as well. Uh, I'm also computing... Um, this guy here, and then I'm computing it here again. So I'm computing it, computing it twice. Um, so there's just all this computation that is being wasted. If I had a, an efficient way of only computing these terms each term once, um, then I will have an efficient algorithm. And essentially, what I'm going to show you next is an efficient way of doing this. Okay. Um, and so the way we're going to do it is by thinking of the network in terms of layers, as we've al already done. And I'm going to abstract it a bit. 
So I have layer uh, 3, layer 2, and layer 1. I'm going to do three layers, but this is true for n layers. I'm doing three layers because that's what we've been doing in our example. And so initially I have Z1 which is equal to X. Um, as I pass forward I get Z2 which is a function of Z1. Then I get, I guess the function will change, so then I get Z3 which is equal to another function of Z2. Uh, two. And eventually I'm going to get the cost which is equal to Z4, which is also a function of the, the previous layer, Z3. Oops, that should be the exponent. Okay, so Z1 feeds into a function, I get out Z2. Z2 feeds into a function, I get out Z3. Um, Z3 goes into a function and I get Z4. And for the particular example we looked at, the functions were the linear function, the softmax function, and the negative log likelihood function. Um, I will then want to design an algorithm that sends the derivatives back. Okay. And I'm going to initialize this as the output derivative. I will initialize it at 1. So the input gets initialized at x. The yeah. output will be initialized at 4. And then I will pass the derivatives backward. And in fact, all I have to design, and this is the important part, I only have to design a module that has this form. Uh, that it takes uh, Z in and it outputs um, a Z output. If this is layer L, this would be layer L plus one. And it will take um, delta L plus 1 and it will produce delta L and occasionally it will produce something that's a derivative of the cost with respect to um, the parameter of that layer. Okay, so that's the setup. Um, we, we're going to focus on one, um, one net. And so in a sense, one, uh, and one layer, sorry. And so you only have to worry about this function that sends, that computes, that goes from input to output. You need to worry about a function that will deal with derivatives and will need to have a function that computes sort of with respect to the parameters of the layer. Now, and, and C being again the cost, the final cost. Um, I still have to define for you de uh, delta, and I will define next. So, um, I will in particular uh, need a function in order to propagate. So, in a sense, I need to know how, um, um, how the output, in order to know how, suppose I have a parameter feet in layer one, in my case it's a, a linear layer. And essentially I want to know how perturbations of that theta will affect the output. And, and to know that, I need to know how theta changes um, Z2 and how Z2 affects Z3 and so on. So I need the perturbations between the inputs to layers and the outputs of layers. If I, if I take all these perturbations, I will know the perturbation of how the perturbation of theta affects, uh, perturbs the output. And so I will need to compute the derivative with respect to any um, input to a layer. And that's what I'm going to define as delta i. And here I'm specifying i as an index of a unit in the layer. So remember, this, each layer has many, could have many units. In our example, there were only two. 
Uh, but in general, you could have n units per lay. And for that, we're just going to use um, the chain rule. So essentially, I'm going to apply the chain rule to a single to a, a single layer. So I have the derivative of c because my output is z out, and there are many z out. I need to take the derivative with respect to each um, output z. output so I, I have uh, each um, each uh, of these z's is a vector so it has uh, with sub index j so there's many of these I need to take the derivative of each output with respect to the input and I need to do each because um, as you saw in this example um, because there's cross terms here um, the way this guy could affect the output it could affect it by following this path or it could affect it by following this other path. So I need to consider all the possible output paths um, uh, uh, to make sure that if I do a small change of theta uh, to be able to calculate what a small change of theta will imply in terms of the change in C of theta. Um, but that's it. That's a change rule for a single layer. And I can write this as a sum of a j, delta j, l plus 1, because by definition, the derivative of c with respect to z is delta. And that's it. That's the trick. It's recursive now. So if I write the derivative with respect to one z, um, that's given in the derivative with respect to the next z. So now if I have a way of initializing it, provided I know how to write, provided I have written code that computes the derivative of the output of a layer with respect to its input, I can compute all the deltas back. Um, the forward message, I just need to specify the forward functions. So I need, I need to know that z out is equal to some function of the input. Okay, so this is called the forward path. And this is the backward <coughs> path. Okay. So if I do a forward path from the input I will be able to, um, these functions, these variables z, they're evaluated at xi, so I need to put in an xi. Um, I evaluate it through the network by passing <coughs> it through the layers, and then I evaluate all these terms here. And this is just one function in the code that I get to call every time I execute a layer. And finally, I need one more thing, is and if the layer has parameters, if layer L has parameters, in this case, layer 1 has parameters, none of the other layers have parameters, um, I do exactly the same thing. Sum of a J, derivative of the cost, respect to Z, J, L plus 1, and then derivative of Z, derivative of Z, J, L plus 1, with respect to the parameter. I keep doing this. <coughs> okay, and I can more succinctly also write this as delta j l plus one times um, the derivative of the output layer or, or of the output of the layer with respect to the parameters of that layer. So once again, provided I specify a function for each layer that computes the derivative of the output of the layer with respect to the parameters, um, 
um, I just need to call, uh, I need to compute, all, I do a forward message to get all the Zs. I do a backward message to get all the deltas. And once I have all the deltas, I can compute the derivative with respect to any parameter. And if I have that, I form the vector, I do gradient descent, I'm done. Um, this slide here is the most important slide I've shown you today. Um, it's the one that if, um, if you have any questions now, this is, this is the magic of uh, how torch and CAF and so on work. And that's why you always need to specify three methods. Um, I'm going to go over some torch code now that looks at these. But essentially you have a forward, which most often is called forward, in fact. Um, and then you don't overload that, you overload <coughs> something else, which I've, uh, I forgot the name. Um, but in, if, you go to, uh, if you go to GitHub um, and you look at the NN class, you can actually look at the implementations of these different layers and you'll see that every layer gets essentially implemented this way. You specify a forward message and a backward message um, and then you, if the layer has parameters, you specify a way of computing that derivative. <coughs> so you need to have three functions and voila, you have a layer. So if you want to get inventive and come up with um, I know, a wavelet layer, then provided you just specify the three um, functions, you can add this to the code very easily. And you can still have all the other layers, you can build networks um, as you wish and be able to do all sorts of compute. Um, most of the layers in NN, and I was trying to look at examples to show you some examples, um, in the, they have a tutorial there and they explain how to build a particular layer called dropout. Um, if time permits next, um, it's a very nice regularization layer. If time permits, I will go over it next week. Um, after I explain neural networks, which is just an extension of this. Um, and so they explain, yeah, they go over the step by step how to build each layer. If you want to look at um, one of the layers I'm using in class today, I actually looked them up because I wanted to show them to you, but uh, late last night, and I realized they're all coded in C. <laughs> so <laughs> um, I think putting a slide with C code will just um, make this unreadable. Um, but you can go over the C code, and um, the, what the modularity gives you is that each piece of code is also short. You know, writing a function is easy. And so if you just write three functions, it's very easy to code. It's very easy to use um, an existing piece of software and be able to contribute to it. And I think that's, um, that's what's nice about it. You can have many researchers using the same tool and, and uh, having the tool grow. And the moment you come up with something that's really good, that's getting better results in some, te uh, in some test set out there, um, and some performance um, test bed, then you can add that layer to GitHub and everyone else can start using it. So it allows for some very rapid development. Um, okay, so if you do the derivative via this um, layer-wise specification, um, So we've already computed the derivative one way, uh, which was by the chain, um, by doing the chain rule. And what I want to show you next, just to give you some reassurance, is that if I apply these rules to compute the derivative, I get the same expression. I think this, to a lot of you that should already be obvious, but if not, um, this would be the steps. So let's assume we want to derive with respect to theta one. Um, then applying the formula that we have here, um, so I'm going to apply uh, essentially this formula. That's just J derivative of the of the cost uh, with respect to. Theta one. Okay, that's for the linear layer. You start at the linear. So basically, I need to sum over the outputs. So at this stage, I'm looking at. I have the linear layer, and I have Z one here. 
and I have Z2 coming as the output. And this is the, the delay that has parameters theta. Um, so if I just think it of as a single layer, the right way for me to compute derivatives would be to just use this expression. Yes. Um, but I can now apply this uh, inductively and I can now use the expression, rewrite this in terms of the expression that you would use for it using again the previous rule. And so that's equal to DC, uh, the sum over K of DC DZK3 times DZ3K DZ2J times DZJ2 D theta 1. Okay. And And then C is uh, C with so that would be now me looking at the softmax. So what I'm looking now is at the log softmax, which takes as input Z2 and output Z3. And now I need to look at one more layer, which is the one that takes Z3 the negative log likelihood and output Z4 which is just a cost and the cost is just one so I don't need to take a sum over all the costs because the sum is just one term um, so I have derivative of the cost uh, with respect to Z4 times DZ4 this of course is one because derivative of the cost the Z4 is equal to C so the derivative is obviously 1. That's why we initialize it at 1 when we go back. Um, DZ4 um, and then I have the other terms. DZ4 times DZ3K DZ3K DZ2J DZ uh, well, I mixed them up here. Uh, yeah, yeah, 2j and d theta 1. Okay. And if you... If you have more patience than me, and actually I, I, did, did, I did it on the train on the way here, I'm not doing this again. Um, just expand the term of a k and the term of a j so you basically now have three products, uh, you have three derivatives multiplying each other. If you sum over k twice, and if you sum over j twice, because in our case for logistic regression, there were two, two outputs in the, each layer. Uh, Z1 was equal to x. Um, then you will get um, this guy here. You'll get the same derivative as before. Because basically we have one term, two terms, three terms, four terms, um, and you're summing of uh, four times this guy. And so that's how we, essentially what we've done is we've just done the chain rule and we just figure out a way of computing it efficiently so we don't do a redundant computation. And also we lear uh, learned a way of how to specify uh, when you have a very large complex system, how to specify that system in terms of small components, and and how to and, and that allows you not only to write um, that, that allows you not only to write more of code much easier and to share code much easily, but it also allows you to think of the tr the problem in much easier terms. It gives you um, you don't need to be carrying the complexity of what we did in the previous lecture of all these layers. It becomes really easy. Um, so the back propagation algorithm is pretty much what we've um, seen. Um, so you start at xi, which is z1. Uh, we then get z2, which is a function still of xi, so that's important. Uh, for example, um, this was xi times theta. That was our definition. So then we get z3, still a function of xi. 
and then you get Z4 which is equal to the cost um, and then you go back um, so you start with delta 4 uh, delta 3 delta 2 and then delta 1 and delta 1 in particular is the derivative of the cost with respect to the input Oh, Z4 is still a function of Xi. Yeah, yeah, if I make it explicit. It, yes, all of them are functions of Xi. I, I omitted, like, in, in my explanation, I didn't put this bracket Xi to keep it clean. But essentially, um, the way you compute X, the compute would X, so Z2 in our case was Xi times theta. This other guy was a log soft max, so it's e to the x i theta, let's say theta 1, um, divided by, you know, that sum of terms. And then the last one was the negative cross entropy. Um, and that's one way to write it, but, uh, but the way we've be, we, uh, I've been advocating is uh, don't think of writing it as this complex function of a function of a function, but rather just think of single layer input and then input out and then input and input out so basically you would write as z2 is a function of z1 and z3 is a function of z2 and then z4 is a function of z3 but I wanted to emphasize that this starts at the data so each layer is a function of the data so in order, in, in, so what I'm trying to say is in, in order to know um, the, um, the values that the layer is computing, you need to do a forward pass first. You're going to back propagation without putting the data through the network. And once you have those values, then you can now work backward and and propagate again using the the delta rule. Um, you get because you have the derivatives of the output with respect to the input evaluated uh, at the data. So you're evaluating everything at the data. Um, and so you go back and you get all the derivatives for that particular data set. So for instance, if you have an image, um, I don't know, an image of uh, um, a cat, um, don't get paid for drawing. <laughs> um, if you have an image of a cat and you have some very complex neural network with many layers, okay, this could be linear, this could be sigmoid, it could be a mix of all these things that's looking at this. And eventually you have some cost function um, if you want to know, and this is essentially Z1, which is the data, yes. the, essentially the image gets stored as a vector. So if you want to know the derivative of the cost with respect to the input, you can actually compute that. Um, or the derivative of any of these outputs with respect to the input. So if this guy, let's call it output 1, and let's call this output k, uh, we can compute the derivative of each output. So if you if you only go up to uh, up to the output layer and then send a message back, you have the derivative with respect to each x, let's let's say each x i to each pixel. So you know how each pixel affects the output, and you can take advantage of this because if you've trained a neural network. Um, on your given images that have the label cat and images that have the label snake and the label dog and the label person and chair and so on. That's essentially what um, the image net competition is. And finally, computers have beaten humans. That, that was recently on the press or something. Um, this competition was very hard to make progress for a long time. And then, like, it's the one that I told you that two years ago. Neural networks made huge 
progress and that since then every year is just like a really dramatic reduction in error and, and now I think we're, it's done you need bigger data sets and the quality is good enough I think very soon um, we might be able to classify every image on the web each object every, that's in the image um, so if you take the derivative of the output respect but what you have is an image with the label cat uh, but but there might be a cat and there might be a glass of milk and so on. So which of these pixels is the cat? You know, so there's the glass of milk here. Um, and so when you take the derivative with respect to the input, and you take its particular, you look at its absolute value, that gives you the rate of change of the output with respect to input. So it tells you which pixels are more um, likely to change the output a particular output. So if each of these output units is coding for a class, dog, cat, zebra, and so on, you pick a single output unit, you back propagate, so you, you go from the image to that output unit, then you back propagate all the deltas to the image, and you compute these guys here, and that will give you a saliency mask. It will tell you where the cat is. Um, there's a very nice paper by um, Karen um, Simonian, who was a postdoc until a few months ago here at Oxford. Um, he won ImageNet last year. Um, he has some of the best confnets in the world right now. Um, if, not, it's, if not the best, he's among the top three for sure that exists. Um, and uh, one of the exercises he did was to do this, and he gets these beautiful segmentations of the objects. There's other ways to do this that are more e effective, but this is a very simple way to actually check you, you've trained your model right, besides just doing predictions. You can also do this to, you might be classifying, like uh, one of my students, Misha Daniel, um, And these are good people to know on GitHub because they have good code. If you're looking for good Python code. Um, he takes the derivatives of outputs of classifiers for text with respect to the input. And so he's able to detect which sentences are more predictive of labels in documents. So it extracts summaries of a document by doing that. OK, to finish, um, this is how Torch does it. Um, you first have to specify a model, and so now it should be clear. You basically, what this is saying is a neural network that's in a sequence. Um, that's what the class NN. If you want anything but a sequence, don't use NN. I know that NN allows you to, but don't. Just go to NN graph. NN graph allows you to do um, more exotic um, graphs. Like, um, for example, Google. Um, had in the competition that won some of the categories of ImageNet last year had networks that were doing this sort of thing. So there were these sort of auxiliary tasks that helped train the middle layers. So if you have many tasks that you're trying to solve, this is one way to do it. Um, so you're trying to predict many things at a time and sort of schedule. How to balance how much weight to put on this class versus on this class is uh, to the best of my knowledge, an open problem. So for the MFOX students, that's one problem you could think of doing. Um, and then for logistic regression, actually I just stole this code from Cogbits, and they were going from two inputs to three classes. They, had a mar they have a marketing application. It's one of the links I gave you earlier. Um, so Cogbits has some old code, but it, it actually has some nice demos. Um, and so they were going from two inputs to three classes, so that's why they needed three. And for our model, we just say, uh, we first need a linear layer, and then we need a log softmax layer. Um, now, towards this one thing that I haven't, that, uh, differently from what I've explained up to now, is it doesn't treat the loss as another layer. It, it is another layer, but it, it treats it specially. Um, and the main reason is quite, quite often you need to just get the predictions you don't want to go in the network all the way to the loss, you just want to go to the output. Just like we were encountering here, you just want to go to the output, not all the way to the loss. 
And so they actually break it, this last section, which is the computation, the loss has its own special layer. Um, so you specify linear, log softmax, and then you specify the loss. Not negative log likelihood. Um, you specify by calling criterion. Um, and then you have parameters. You, the um, model.getParameters will give you the parameters and the derivative with respect to the parameters. Here, x means parameters. Um, and I took this from their webpage. Um, and so then in order to compute um, the, in, so in order to evaluate everything, what you do is you first, and this is the forward pass, you take the inputs and you forward them to the, uh, to the output. Um, and then you need to do one more forward uh, to evaluate the loss. Because there's two, so there's the, there's the input and you go all the way and then you have the output and then that goes into the into the loss criterion um, and then the loss criterion basic looks at the difference between what it should be the target minus um, the the prediction which um, I don't know um, outputs so essentially you evaluate the loss to evaluate the loss, you need to know the labels. The target is just the labels. So you go forward, and then you go forward one more step. That's why it's coded this way. And now to go backward, you need to go backward sort of in two steps again. So you first go backward in the loss, and then you go backward to the inputs. And just by calling those two functions, you get all the deltas. Um, and then you're all playing with the code right now, so you can look at the rest of the code which basically tells you the only thing left was once you have that is you call a function like that you specify those um, the calls to those functions in a separate function um, um, these are the parameters and then you need to specify the learning rates momentum weight decay etc the very uh, whether you're doing line search or whatever um, th and that's about it. That's how you implement backpropagation in Torch. And everything uses the same building blocks. When you go to ConfNets, when you go to RNNs, the rest of the, this course is always based on these three messages, forward, backward, derivatives with respect to. And because it's all modular like this, we will now be able to construct any kind of neural network we want. That's it. Thank you.